taking a look deeper into the brain and the brain structures and function. So when we look at the brain itself and we look at the cerebrum, we're going to see that functionally we have areas for motor control, we have areas for sensory information coming in, and then we have areas that are going to process those that information, our association areas. For the motor side of things, we talked about before about having a primary motor cortex, a premotor cortex, Broca's area, and frontal eye fields. And so we're just going to concentrate on those four areas within the motor control itself. <clears throat> so the primary motor cortex, this is the area that's within the precentral gyrus. This is essentially the final plan, in a sense, that is going to go from the cortex it has our upper motor neurons in him, and they're going to then travel down to the spinal cord itself. This allows for very precise starts and stops of muscles um, in terms of their contractions. It's put into the premotor cortex as a kind of a caricature drawing of the body. And so we have what we call a motor homunculus. And this homunculus is essentially a representation of where within the cortex we're going to find each portion of the body itself. And so we can see that we have different areas that are involved with the body. And so when we look at it, one of the stark things that we're going to see is that things like the face has an awful large amount of cortex dedicated to it versus, say, the trunk, which has relatively little dedicated to it. And this all comes down to the fact that we have a different set of motor units in those two different areas. For the face, the hand, and even the foot, we have a large number of motor units. And so the motor units themselves are relatively small. So each individual motor neuron is controlling just a few muscle cells which means that for that fine motor control that we have of the foot, the hand, and the face, we need to be able to have a large number of neurons come out of that primary motor cortex that's there. The premotor cortex is essentially the area that is going to make up the plan. And so this is where we're going to develop the plan for that motor control. And so this is the area where if you were in sports, they may have talked about things like developing motor memory, <clears throat> And that motor memory is your ability to do the same skill over and over and over again and learn that skill and perfect it and so on as you're practicing. And this is where that premotor cortex is basically getting that plan down, getting that plan down and going over those same movements again and again and again. And so premotor cortex is going to fire to the primary motor cortex. And then the primary motor cortex is then going to send its upper motor neurons down to the spinal cord. Broca's area is a special area just for speech. And so this is the area of the brain that fires off basically just before we're about to say something. And so as I'm about to say a particular word, Broca's area is going to fire off and this is going to send that information then over to the primary motor cortex. And this is going to then send that information down to my lips, my tongue, everything that's involved in terms of uh, controlling speech itself and generating the actual sounds that we have uh, developed. And again, this is a learned area. We learn to make the sounds that we, we make as a young child, <clears throat> and we copy them and repeat them and repeat them over and over and over again. And this is where we start to learn that pattern for what muscles need to go where uh, in order to actually make the sounds that we want to make for speech. The frontal eye field is in a sense a specific area just for vision and so this is not for actual our ability to see per se but it controls eye movement and so this is going to coordinate the movement of our eyes and this is going to fire off as our eyes begin to want to uh, move and so as we look from side to side up and down etc frontal eye field is going to fire off and then fire over into the primary motor cortex to coordinate that movement. Next up we have our sensory areas 
and sensory works somewhat similar to that of motor in that we have kind of a primary area and then we have other areas that in, are involved as well and in as far as sensory goes these are going to be what we call our association areas and so we have primary somatosensory and then that fires into the somatosensory association areas we have primary visual that fires over into the visual association areas and so on and so for general senses we have all of our information controlled over in primary somatosensory and then each of our special senses gets its own specific area for its primary information as well and so primary somatosensory is found within the post central gyrus and so that's where we're going to send all of that specific sensory information that's coming in from the hand the arm the leg etc wherever it happens to be and then for each of our special senses it has its own primary area as well and so they're going to have their own specific areas for the control of that information the primary somatosensory cortex in that post central gyrus also has a homunculus and so similar to that of the motor it's going to have a homunculus that basically maps out the entire body on that primary motor or uh, primary sensory cortex that is there this information that's there is going to allow for us to have a very distinct knowledge of exactly what part of the body has just been touched or warmed up or whatever happens to be um, as far as that sensory information that is coming in and so once again we look at it and we see that we have a disproportionate type of a caricature here and so once again the head the hands the feet all have extra amount of space in relationship to places like the trunk or the hip or the neck essentially the entire torso fits in the same amount of space as that of the foot or the hand and what that then comes down to is uh, relating back to partially to the motor side of things in that uh, if we have a motor control and we think back to Hilton's law uh, this also tells us that we need to have sensory information coming through that same neuron or through that same nerve as well and so where we have a motor nerve sending information to that particular joint uh, that muscle that's there we also are going to get information back in terms of the sensory information as well the association areas in a sense kind of put a label on things and so this is where the association areas for somatosensory <clears throat> and our special senses essentially let us know what that particular type of information was and so it's going to tell us exactly where on the body that information came from and then it's also going to discern the type of information that it was was it light touch deep touch uh, vibration was it temperature change was it pain all of that information is going to be then sent over from that primary somatosensory area over to the association area and then we're going to process all the information that came in is it something that we've experienced before is it something we've not experienced before have we touched this thing before um, do we know that information that is coming in to be something that we've come across in the past <clears throat> for our special senses we have the visual areas for vision and so we have primary visual cortex this is all the way back at the very back of the occipital lobe which means that typically when we look at sensory information our primary area is going to be kind of more anterior and then the posterior to that is going to be the association area and so for the visual side since it's all the way at the very back of the occipital lobe it only can go forward in a sense for the association area and so essentially the primary visual cortex tells us about information and tells us that something in a sense has excited the retina itself and so we've had photons come into the eye and they've then told the the eye that they've had some sort of uh, light hit it at that particular point <clears throat> from there the association area then interprets that information and this is again kind of putting the label on things and so what color is it what kind of a form does it take um, is it moving is it not moving is it a potential threat all of that information gets processed in the association areas for auditory we're going to do kind of the same thing and so our auditory cortex uh, 
for the primary area is essentially just kind of straight in from the external auditory canal through the internal auditory canal and we pretty much come to our primary auditory cortex that's there the association area is just posterior to it <clears throat> for our primary information we get information about the pitch so is it a high pitch is it a low pitch is there any kind of rhythm to it is it going in a pattern and then what's the intensity how loud is that information that's coming in there all of that information then has to go over to the association area where we can then again put all of the labels on those things is there a memory of what we're hearing is it something that we've heard before is it a person's voice um, is it maybe something that sounds familiar but we're not necessarily 100 percent sure what that sound is um, that's there but we can compare it to our past experiences for things that are there as well and this happens to also fall into a brain region called Wernicke's area the association areas themselves <clears throat> then we take all of this essential sensory information and we kind of need to process it and so we're going to process the sensory information we're going to process motor information and send it over to different areas of the cortex as well so we have areas for prefrontal cortex we have language areas that are specific to different portions of language themselves uh, we have general kind of interpretation of general pieces of information that we're coming in contact every day and then we have the ability to interpret our visceral information as well so those different association areas can be found in different portions we're now starting to get into parts of the frontal cortex and so we're going to see in the prefrontal cortex here we're going to see parts of our language up here in, in Broca's area. We're now getting into that frontal cortex in and of itself so that we can see where that information is coming from. From there, we have inside the prefrontal cortex. This is, to a certain degree, uh, prefrontal cortex is somewhat of kind of who you are. And so this is the anterior portion of that frontal lobe. This is our ability to interpret information that's coming in, so intellect and cognition. And so we can take that information and kind of, of interpret it as it's coming in. Uh, many of our memories are here, so recall. And then the part of who you are becomes the personality. And so what kind of personality do you have are all formed here in the prefrontal cortex. This gets us everything that in a sense kind of makes us human, things like judgment and reasoning can we work through a problem itself do we have that ability to to uh, understand or even give empathy or sympathy in terms of those uh, portions there as well deep inside this area we have the limbic system and the limbic system is going to be utilized for essentially the emotional side of things everything from happy to mad um, sad all of that component there is housed partially within that limbic system itself the language areas are special in the sense that language is not just what we think about in terms of language as just speech and so language involves the written word it involves hearing and it involves actually speaking as well and so we have many different areas that are going to be involved within the language process and the processing of of language information itself <clears throat> and so as you go through anatomy and physiology one of the thing areas of the brain where you use quite a bit is Wernicke's area and so Wernicke's area is involved in sounding out unfamiliar words you're seeing all these new terms and you need to try and figure out how they are said or you hear the word you're looking through different materials and you hear a word and you try and then repeat it again later on and part of that is coming up with that uh, sounding out of the word as well from there we have Broca's area we talked a little bit about Broca's area before and so Broca's area is all about the actual production of speech and so this is the the sound component in terms of our ability to make language happen from our mouth um, and so Broca's area is integral into that process as well. And so Wernicke's area would fire off, send information over to Broca's area about what we need to do in order to make that sound happen. The lateral prefrontal cortex, 
is all about word analysis. What do the words themselves mean? What does the pattern of the words mean as we put them together uh, within that? Context is important. And then further into the temporal lobe, we get into coordinating the visual aspects of language. And so the written component of language with the auditory components. And so again, as we're reading, as we're looking at the words themselves, how do we interpret that particular information? But visual, visual aspects can also mean things like body language. And so we have different components that work within the language areas themselves. And all of that has to kind of come together perfectly in order for our understanding of language to work for us as well. If something along those processes tends to break down, we're going to have an aphasia. And so an aphasia is going to come in when we have a inability to do one aspect or multiple aspects of the language process itself. And so we can have an expressive aphasia. Expressive aphasias are essentially the person can't speak the words. And so this is where oftentimes the damage is within Broca's area. So our motor component for speech itself, they know what they want to say, but they can't get the words out. It may be garbled, it may be um, coming out in the wrong order, things like that. Whereas expressive aphasia is all about them trying to express themselves, receptive aphasia is all about understanding the information as it's coming into them. And again, since language comes in essentially a auditory side, we can hear somebody speaking the language as well as the written side of language, we can have basically two different types of receptive aphasia. We can have word deafness, where the person just doesn't understand what somebody's saying. They may have spoken one language their entire life, and after the damage has occurred in this area, uh, they no longer can understand what the person is saying. Uh, and there it's as if they are being spoken to in a completely different language. They have no idea what the words mean. Word blindness is similar to that, but this is for the written word. And so this is for being able to read the language itself. Now they start to look at the, the characters that make up the words that they're trying to read. And once again, they mean absolutely nothing to them. <clears throat> and so this is going to be we're kind of oftentimes processing that auditory association areas, the integrative areas have been damaged. And a lot of times these damages are either from things like closed head injuries um, or from uh, things like stroke as well. We also need to be able to interpret visceral information. And so although we don't always have conscious perception of everything that is going on as far as the viscera are concerned, uh, that visceral information, we do get some sensation of what is going on there. And so within that deeply buried lobe of the brain called the insula, we have this processing of information that is coming from the viscera itself. And so this is where we have information like things of being thirsty. And so if a person is thirsty, why are they thirsty? And so that thirst may be coming from a visceral component. And so they have a decrease in the amount of, of water that they have in their blood. And so they don't have the, the correct amount in a sense for what they need. Um, or they have an ion imbalance, things like that. Hunger, uh, in terms of, of being hungry, this is generally a, a product of a decrease in glucose levels in the blood. So we don't necessarily know what the exact stimulus is in terms of where it's coming from in the, the viscera, but we interpret that, that information and we get a conscious perception of kind of the feeling that we get from it. From there, when we look at the cortex itself, uh, we mentioned before that the, the cortex does not have the exact same information being processed on either hemisphere. And so we're going to have essentially some information being processed on one side of the cortex, but not the other side of the cortex. Um, each one is going to kind of share some information with the other side. And so we're going to have some information that does cross the, the cerebrum itself and move from the right to the left and the left to the right. Um, that is there. In general, when we think about the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere is 
controlling things like language, math, logic, in a sense, kind of things that have a distinct pattern, a distinct kind of relationship where one thing follows the next. What do you do after this? What do you do after that? And things like that. And so it follows this logical kind of a pattern for things. And that's what, when you think about it, language is all about rules. Math is all about rules. You have to do things this way, then you do it that way and so on. And that changes uh, the pattern and we get the wrong answer in a sense if we do it in the wrong way. Versus the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere controls information that is more in the abstract. And so it's controlling different things that is there. Um, whereas the, the left hemisphere would be kind of more of like your sciences kind of thing, the right hemisphere would be more of your artistic side of things. And so this is being able to look at things and see different types of spatial relationships between things, um, having seeing an emotional component in something when it's there, it's not necessarily uh, specifically evident that it's there. Um, those kinds of things are, are controlled by the right hemisphere. In order to get information from one place to the next, we need to have a way to move the information around within the cortex itself as well. And so when we want to move from one hemisphere to the other, we're going to have things like commissures. And so we're going to have a way to get white matter to move. So our connections uh, between one side of the brain and the other, we're going to utilize commissures to go from, say, the postcentral gyrus, where we have our primary somatosensory information, and move it over to the association area, we're going to use association fibers. And so those association fibers essentially are within the same hemisphere. It's just either going forwards or back within that hemisphere itself. As we send information either up or down the cord, we're going to utilize projection fibers. And so this is going from the, the brain to the uh, cord itself somewhere along in those pathways or from one part of the brain, a lower center up to a higher center of the brain as well. And so here we can see those association type fibers jumping from one portion of the cortex to the next, just going simply forwards or backwards in terms of the information that is there. We can move information relatively far as well within that. Projection fibers get us information going to higher or lower areas of the cortex. Our commissural fibers, we have big corpus callosum here connecting the two halves of the brain itself and so between the two hemispheres themselves. Here we can see big motor information coming down and so we have large projection fibers for all of our motor content that's going to make its way from the cortex down to the spinal cord itself. Deep inside the brain we have the basal nuclei and so the basal nuclei are back when we were talking about where white matter and gray matter are uh, we talked about the, the white matter being kind of on the inside of the cork of the cerebrum. And, but within that white matter, we saw some gray matter. Some of that gray matter that we saw was what we call the basal nuclei. And so we have a couple different portions to it. We have the caudate nucleus. We have the lentiform nucleus. And then we have parts of the internal capsule. And so these are going to be connected together. It tends to look, when we see it, it always reminds me of something like a court jester's hat or like a uh, something from medieval times or something like that. Um, big hat with this swooping kind of component. It's in both hemispheres, so we have one in either side. It also kind of looks like the ventricles, so it kind of uh, mirrors the lateral ventricle in terms of its shape um, that's there. And we can see these large nuclei that are inside there as well. Um, going all through the basal nuclei here and making its way all the way around there. It's just lateral to the diencephalon. So you can see the thalamus there as well. And so that's gonna be sitting just medial to the lentiform nucleus. On an anterior view here, we can start to see that it does go fairly far in terms of its pathway. And so we can see the caudate nucleus here and the, the lentiform nucleus there as well. Um, you can see, although it looked like the, the thalamus was relatively small on that other picture, the thalamus is relatively large there. 
between those two portions there as well. Functionally, when it comes to the, the basal nuclei, um, one of the, the big things that basal nuclei do is to help with motor control. And so it's going to inhibit muscle contraction when we don't want it to be contracting. And so when we're essentially wanting the muscles to be at rest, it's going to inhibit that motor control, especially in antagonistic muscles. When this doesn't fire properly, this is where we tend to get tremors. And this is where we tend to get a, a, a tremor that goes back and forth and back and forth. Think of like Parkinson's disease here. And so we have uh, supination and pronation quickly of the forearms themselves uh, because it's not being held in inhibition at that point. From there, we have the other components of the basal nuclei themselves. Um, it is involved in kind of slow stereotyped kinds of movements. And so when we don't have to really have a whole lot of uh, control there, things like walking uh, movements uh, that is there, cognitive types of skills. And so this is where this is going to influence the, the cognitive uh, pattern that may be occurring. And so figuring out what the, the problem per se is. And then overall just has kind of a, a motor uh, influence over it in terms of helping to smooth out the normal motor control. And next up, we'll start to talk about the diencephalon.